Vaughn, thank you. And Dirt Van, thank you for being here. All right, Bob wants to do it again. <laughs> Better check with Mary. It's been, uh, I don't know, 15, 16, 17 years, something like that. But uh, one of the weaker moments in my life, I decided I wanted to go back to school to get another degree. And so I applied to the MBA program at Butler University. I don't know if they were doing it with everybody, but I, I, I got a personal interview. And so I sat down with, I think it was a couple of professors, and they asked me why I wanted, as somebody who was already in a profession, why I wanted to come back and work on an MBA. And I looked at him and said, well, I, I want to come here so that I can plunder the Egyptians. Uh, I could have grown purple horns and gotten orange polka dots and gotten less of a blank surprise stare. It was just, huh? And I said, well, you know, they said, could you possibly elaborate on that, what you mean? And I said, well, it, it's from the Bible. Uh, the story is that when the people of Israel came out of Egypt, uh, they were coming out after the Passover and all the Egyptians had lost the firstborn and the Egyptians were anxious to get rid of them. And Moses had instructed them that before they left, they should ask the Egyptian people for things of value, silver and gold. And the Egyptians gave them all these great things of value. The people of Israel plundered, took things of value from the Egyptians. And that was my goal in working on an MBA, was to go and look at the secular world, look at a business uh, perspective, and find what I could there that would be helpful to the, to the church. And it, it was helpful for me. I didn't finish the degree because there came a point where it was no longer being helpful. For a while it was. I, you know, I learned to read an, read an, accounty spread, an accounting spreadsheet. I learned some business principles, and it, it was a, a good experience. But, you know, the church has always been at that business of plundering the Egyptians. The church has always been in the business of looking at what the world is doing and then uh, integrating some of those practices into who we are. I mean, one of the places that's really obvious is with the hospitality industry. The hospitality industry in America is big, big business. Think of all the restaurants, all the hotels, all the resorts, all the casinos, all the tourist attractions. It is big, big business. And because it's big business, they have spent a whole lot of money learning how to get your money, learning how to do it better. And so we spend some time looking at what people who are practicing hospitality do, and we try to incorporate that into the church. And it's very easy to see. I mean, uh, you think of McDonald's. When you go to McDonald's, everybody's wearing a name tag. Restrooms are clean. So what do we do? We invite some people to wear name tags. All the staff should have name tags on almost all the time. And we actually have a staff member that comes in on Saturday evening and walks through every bathroom in the building to make sure it is good for Sunday morning use. We work hard at making sure we're like McDonald's. We have that hospitality. Uh, when you think of hospitality, you think of Walmart. You walk into Walmart, what's the first thing that happens when you walk in their door? Welcome to Walmart. And so we try to put greeters at our door. We don't say welcome to Walmart, we say welcome to First Church, but uh, we, we take that idea. Uh, you go to a lot of places and uh, a lot of hotels these days, and when you walk in, they offer you uh, a cookie or a cup of coffee or a donut. And so now we have coffee and donuts, practicing hospitality, what we've learned from the world. Uh, we're still learning that. Uh, Brian down here works with community, and one of the things that I've learned from Brian is that when you ask somebody directions of community, it's supposed to be show them, don't tell them, that they're supposed to actually guide you to where it's being. And so we're trying to learn that here. When somebody says, where's the nursery? We don't say go down the steps in this way. We take them. We, we show them. The only problem with all of that is is that the Bible calls us to offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. And this sort of friendliness, this welcoming, this uh, practice of making people feel comfortable, isn't at all what the Scripture means when it says, offer hospitality. 
In fact, what we're offering and calling hospitality is more like a welcome or entertainment. It is not the hospitality that the Scripture calls us to share with one another. That hospitality goes far deeper and is far more complicated. The actual Greek word for hospitality at this point is not all that common. It is a compound word of two different Greek words. The word is used is philoxenos. Philoxenos. And it is the combination of two words, phileo and xenos. Now, don't worry about that. I'm going to try to explain them. Phileo is uh, the, one of the Greek words for love. Uh, you probably have been, you know, heard the stories about how the Greeks had different words for love. They had erotic love, eros. They had agape love, which we've incorporated as Christian love. They had uh, phileos, which uh, means brotherly love. It's the city of brotherly love. Philadelphia comes from phileos. Uh, but we've, we've not really gotten into what that type of love is about. It's not so much brotherly love as it is the kind of love you would offer a brother. Uh, phileos is a love for those who are closest to you. Those that are part of your inner circle. Those that are, you're, you have an a, a, a intimacy with in, in conversation. Phileos is a, a word that actually began to be associated with a kiss. When, when you have phileos, you have uh, if, if you go to a lot of countries, you know how uh, people would greet one another to kiss. Now, we Americans, we've got a whole different view of kissing, and so we don't so much do it. But you've seen it. The men will walk up to one another, they'll put the right hand on the other person's left shoulder, and they'll kiss them on the cheek, and then they'll put their left hand on the right shoulder and kiss them on the cheek. That, that is a symbol of phileos, that an acceptance, and an openness, a welcome. In America, we don't let people get close enough to kiss us. We keep people at arm's length, literally, arm's length. Our personal distance in America is about two feet. Even when we shake hands with somebody, we do it two feet away. Uh, there's all sorts of experiments you can do. You can have two people uh, who are relatively relative strangers say, now we want you to walk close to each other, and when you feel uncomfortable, stop, and they'll start approaching each other, and when they get two to three feet, they'll stop. That's as far as we're comfortable letting other people in. But this phileos, this word, is a word that means we let people in. When you phileos, when you love somebody, if this love, you, you take down that barrier. You let them into your life. You let them beyond arm's length. You let them become incorporated into who you are. Now, the second word is uh, almost just the opposite. You see, the word for hospitality in the Greek is, is what we in English would call an oxymoron. Two words that don't seem to go together. Because the, the second word, xenos, is a word that means uh, somebody not like you. It means stranger, alien, uh, immigrant. It means somebody who is not part of your group. Somebody you normally wouldn't offer phileos to. Uh, the... the in, in, in primitive men, the stranger was the enemy. In fact, in a lot of cultures, their languages, they have only one word, and they use it for both stranger and enemy. Uh, the reason was that if you met somebody who was different from you, you know, you were out and hunting and walking, and all of a sudden you encountered somebody who wasn't like you, they weren't dressed like you, they didn't look like you, they didn't have the war paint on like you do, they, they didn't match up. The safest thing that you could do when you came across a stranger in that situation was to kill them. Kill them. You didn't know what else. I mean, you, this is survival, and if you came upon a stranger, you killed them. You assume a stranger was an enemy. And we still do that. It's not so much that we kill them physically. We're, we're too civilized for that. But we, we kill them off psychologically. And by that I mean when we see somebody who is a stranger to us, we go shields up. And all of a sudden, they're dead to us. It's like they don't exist. And we don't even see them anymore. <clears throat> we just totally wipe them out of our consciousness. 
Uh, sometimes we physically will make a change. We'll be walking down the street and we'll see somebody strange coming toward us. Maybe it, it, you know, it's a kid in goth or somebody who, who's really dressed differently. And we will either get all the way to the side or sometimes actually cross the street to get away from the stranger because that image of stranger as enemy still remains. So, so we kill them off from our sight. And yet, this word um, for hospitality means that we are to bring those strangers into our intimate space. But one of the things we've got to remember is it's far harder on the stranger than it is for us to get close, especially when it involves in the church. Kind of think, you know, most of us do not like to stand out in a crowd. Most of us do not like for people to be looking at us and wondering, questioning about us. If you decide to come to a church for a very first time on a Sunday, it is a tough experience because you don't know the rules. You're a stranger. And not only are people here wanting to kind of ignore you, it just is natural, uh, it, it's pretty frightening because instinctively you think there's all these people out who could kill me. You know, they might say something about me. They might judge me. And so it's a pretty scary thing. And yet that's why Peter makes such a point that we are to love philios, the stranger, xenos. That's what hospitality is. At bringing a strange person close. That's what Jesus did. My, Jesus picked the strangest people you can imagine to bring close. He picked some real winners. He picked people that if we saw walking toward us, we wouldn't just cross the street. We'd turn around and go around the block. They were really some strange folk. I mean, one of the persons was this guy. His nickname was Legion because he was crazy. I mean, so crazy that he looked like something out of the zombie movies. I mean, he walked around naked, he's all beat up, cut and bruised, he got ropes and chains hanging from him, and he comes racing toward Jesus, and Jesus heals the man and embraces the man. He offers him hospitality. He welcomes the stranger in. Oh, remember that woman at the well? Oh, she was strange. Everybody in town knew how strange she was because this woman, she'd had five husbands already. She was working on her six. She, everybody knew this was about her, that she was, well, and boy, can you imagine the gospel about her? And Jesus met her at a well in the middle of the day when nobody does in hard work because it's hot and she's there getting water and Jesus offers her hospitality. He opens himself up to welcome this woman into his love. He, strange people. One of the strangest people he met was this ugly toad named uh, Zacchaeus. Remember Zacchaeus? He, he was ugly. Short little dude. And he wanted to see Jesus. He wanted to see the sights. So he climbed up in the tree. Now I don't know if he was physically ugly or not. You know. He, he may have been a, a Tom Cruise shrimp type of thing. But. We know that he was, he was emotionally ugly because he was a tax collector. He was betraying Israel. He was taking things from people that wasn't fair. And it, it, he, just, he was an ugly person. And he climbed up the tree to see Jesus. And Jesus offered him hospitality. Phileos, brotherly love, welcomed him in even though he was strange. See, that's what we are to be about as Christians. But it's not easy. That's why Peter says you've got to learn to do this without grumbling, without murmuring, without saying, I don't, I don't want to do this. You see, the, uh, the grumbling, it is a recognition that it's not hard. I mean, it is hard for us to drop those shields, take the blinders off, and to see the people around us. It is difficult to do. The people who are able to do it the easiest, the folk who are able to best welcome strangers tend to be people who know what it's like to be a stranger. They've been there, done that, got the t-shirt. I mean, that's what the nation of Israel 
nation of Israel, one of the big things that they had, it's in the Old Testament, is that when a stranger came to your door, you welcomed them in. Literally, you opened your door, you made them the king of the house, you offered them a kiss, you washed their feet, you fed them your food, you gave them your water, you took care, you protected them. You see, they did that because they had themselves once been an outcast, once been a stranger. And because they knew how horrible it felt to be a stranger, they wanted to invite people in. But you see, we as Christians ought to get that. We really ought to get that. Because every one of us has been estranged from God by our sin. Scripture says that we, we were estranged from God. We were, were the outcasts. We were the Gentiles. We were those that were not worthy. We were uh, uh, those that were tossed aside. And yet through the love of Christ, we have all been brought in to the family of God. We know what it's like to be a stranger. Just some of us have forgotten. We know what it's like to be an outcast, to be ignored, for people just not to see us. We ought to be sensitive. And it's really a key for us at church. People coming here are looking for a place that people might, might just possibly be open to them. Talked to a young woman a couple weeks ago. And we, we were just chatting. And she asked what I did. And I told her I was a pastor. And she said, where? And I told her, the, you know, Touchdown Jesus Church the church at the end of the football field, I find that's the easiest way to tell people from Noblesville where we are, we're at the end of the football field. Some of them I've told them we're across the street from the jail, that gets it in, but uh, either one of those two. Uh, so she said, yeah, I know that church. And she said then, well, what, what's different about your church? I know there's a lot of churches in town. She said, I've never been religious. I don't know anything about churches. What makes your church different from all the other churches? Wow. You see, here's somebody that doesn't know anything about church. So she's not asking our theological position on the method and modes of baptism. She's not asking our historical, whether we relate to Wesley or Calvin or any of that. And it really was a tough question. And I finally came up with, well, we're the church that uh, pretty much accepts whoever walks in. We practice love and grace. I, thought, well, I really like that. I really like being a part of a church like this, that whoever walks in, we're, we're, we're going to offer some acceptance to. You know, sometimes we mess up and we mess people, but normally, it doesn't matter if you're rich or poor. It doesn't matter how tall you are. It doesn't matter how much... Uh, education you've got, doesn't matter what color your skin is, you come in, you're part of the family, you're home, and we welcome you. Sometimes we need people to help us do that, and God usually gives churches some really good um, people who practice hospitality, it's their gift. Uh, now, in every church I've been, there's always been at least one person who, if you were new in that church on a particular Sunday, it's like they had radar for new people. And you'd show up on a blip on their radar, and they, they would track you down. And they'd grab a hold of you. And, you know, even if you already had plans for lunch and you, you needed to leave, didn't matter. They got a hold of you, and they drug you to the pastor. And they introduced you. And they made sure the pastor knew who you were. I have people in my church, uh, like, uh, like Bill and like Frida. And all my churches have had folk who have done that. We've had one here. Actually, this beautiful lady sitting down here, Frances Lively. Frances, I don't know how many dozens of people over the years you have brought to the pastor and introduced. You just had that ability to grab a hold of them, bring them up, and get them introduced. But you're kind of in retirement now. So the question is, who's going to be our next Francis? Who's going to be the next folk? who makes it their point, their ministry, their issue, that when somebody new is in church, they're among the first to offer them hospitality, to bring them in, to kiss them with the love of God, to welcome them into the fellowship. You need to explain to your mom what I was just talking about. She's down there trying to figure it out.
offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Wow, what a challenge. Let's pray. Father, just like uh, Jesus did when he walked the earth, we encounter strange people all the time. We see strange people that uh, aren't like us, that are walking down the street, or sometimes we see them in restaurants, or they move in close to us, or they come to church, and we shut them out. Father, forgive us for that selfishness. Help us to open our hearts. Help us to realize that we too have been strangers and embrace those who come in and offer them the acceptance and the grace and love that we have found through Jesus' act on the cross for us. Hear our prayers, Lord. We pray them in Christ's name. Amen.